Governor, uh, we always like to start with saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in our culture. In the name of God, most merciful. And uh, I really want to truly thank you for making the trip such a long way from the capital, which you kindly invite me to visit next visit around. I seem to be connected now to about five invitations to come back to Pennsylvania. Uh, I want to welcome you here among friends and welcome our colleagues, the wonderful people of uh, Pittsburgh, especially Simon and her colleagues, Dr. Ismail, and of course my colleague, my friend, Ambassador Jubeir, and my ex-co-runner. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Al-Jubeir, Dr. Al-Jubeir had something prepared. He's always ready for action. Uh, he's a great ambassador, and Saudi Arabia is very proud of him, truly. But uh, today and tonight is a special night. <clears throat> uh, to begin with, Pittsburgh has a special place in my heart. came here in uh, 1983 and uh, entrusted the care of a family member to a great doctor, somebody in Pittsburgh should be proud of, Dr. Thomas Stasel. If you would stand up, Dr. Stasel, and be recognized. There is a man that has uh, spent a lifetime uh, giving and helping humanity and uh, Sta uh, Pittsburgh became really a, an excellent center of excellence in transplant surgery and in medicine. And I'm really glad to see the transition from 83 to the times I came again, 96 and 97, to see Pittsburgh today as we were yesterday in the host in the being hosted by some of these people in Le Mans and to see Pittsburgh at dusk being so clean and so wonderful is really heartwarming. So you should be proud of Pennsylvania, you should be proud of Pittsburgh. The work has been done, the cooperation has been uh, done here to reinvent the city, its economy and its place. I also uh, heard something that I'm going to repeat in Texas when we go in Houston, go to Houston in December for the exhibition, that really oil uh, refining began here. In Pennsylvania, not in Texas. So I don't know what's going to happen when I say that in Texas, but I'm going to be ready for it. <laughs> but truly, I've been asked today, spent about three and a half, four hours, TV interviews and so on, why are we here? And I think Ambassador Jubeir has covered pretty much a good part of that. But Saudi Arabia is really embarking on a new world today, a new future. The great king, King Abdullah, has taken upon himself to challenge the fact of life. These days, it's very important to be a wise leader, but also important to be a, a brave leader. And nations have never been reinvented or have found direction except in the hands and following great, wise, brave leaders. And I would not have been, myself and my colleagues, I don't work alone really, uh, to do this without the wise direction of King Abdullah, without, without him standing uh, and giving us the tailwinds that we need, spoken as a pilot, to do this. We are completely reinventing the way Saudi Arabia sees itself. Of course, we are known uh, throughout the world for being the land of Islam, very proudly so. Of course, we are known with being a great economy and the greatest and the largest producer of oil. And of course, we are known for our international presence. People like Ambassador Jubeir and his colleagues with the direction of our king and crown prince have been crisscrossing the world, bringing peace. And of course we have uh, a very special relationship with the United States. It is a relationship not just based on oil, as you all know. It's a relationship that started with a semantic with a meeting between the two great men, the father of Saudi Arabia, King of Aziz, and the uh, President Roosevelt in 1945. I heard stories from uh, the pilot who flew, the president that was sent in Kabaziz, Captain Joe Grant, someone we uh, found through uh, some friends here in the United States, and who spent time in Saudi Arabia and came back and told his stories what Saudi Arabia was like, what it was, was it like flying in East Three, that did President Roosevelt sent to King Kabaziz those days. And I was lucky enough, before the East Three was basically a museum, please. Uh, to have flown the airplane when it was coming out of the hangar, and uh, insisted that I sneak in and fly it for an hour or so. But that friendship was a friendship of trust and a friendship of mutual admiration. That friendship is actually uh, been the dialogue of the discussion uh, being documented in a great book by Captain Eddy, Colonel Eddy, who was a translator. The book is available actually on, on, on the net to download. The two men saw each other as 
working by it all. One man was putting together a fragmented nation that has never been put together or come together as a unified nation ever in history except two times. One time during the prophet days, the prophet Muhammad and the second time during the Saudi nation, which launched in 1745. And this nation has been destroyed from outside forces twice and still got up and managed to create itself or recreate itself because its own people believed in nationhood and believed in unity. A diversified culture, every, uh, every different kind of culture that existed in the mountains, Saudi Arabia is not all desert, the mountains and the deserts and the seashores of Saudi Arabia, bringing such a nation together in a unified way and not only that, keeping it, as you see today, the most stable nation in the Middle East, the most prosperous nation in the Middle East, a nation in the south of Saudi Arabia, uh, the host and the home of Islam, a big responsibility on the shoulders of Saudi people, that is not a, an easy task. King Abdelaziz was known to have said, have admired the rising nation called the United States of America as a nation of values, as people of will, and as a people of tenacity, people who can really make things happen. He admired that model, and he thought of his own people, uh, as history tells us, as a people of, again, will and pride and tenacity. So it was natural for the two countries to meet and to continue a very strong relationship that is now, I think, um, Bastard Jibir, I'm sure, will, will reiterate that, in the strongest period of its history. The two nations have worked towards peace, stopping wars, making the world economy better, and cooperating in everything that you can think of, including economic cooperation, benefiting Bisburg itself through Westinghouse and through our initiative to build uh, nuclear power for safe usage. So the exhibition is here to tell a story and to open a window. It's a big window, in fact. To show Saudi Arabia from the perspective of its heritage and its history, to show that we are not a people that came from nowhere. To show that, that we stand tall on the shoulders of great civilizations and great cultures, and proudly so. And to show that Islam, as a great religion, never seen itself and never said that Islam was a new religion to begin with. Islam was seen and said that it is the completion of our religions, that it is a religion that believes, we as Muslims believe, and the great prophets, Moses and Jesus, and cannot be a true Muslim unless you believe in those prophets and the other great prophets. But it shows also that Islam did not come to a void or an empty desert, or like has been said uh, to a bunch of sheep herders. Because in Arabia, we don't look kindly to cowboys. We, we herd sheep and camels. <laughs> and people who, who herd cows are not looked favorably. It's like people who heard sheep in Texas are not looked favorably. <laughs> but Islam came to a great civilization, came to a multitude of civilization that, and a lot of cultures that have crisscrossed the roads of Arabia, carrying the caravans and trading, and left an imprint on, on us. We are, I stand with you today, uh, admitting that we are genetically, have been programmed to become who we are today. We are the people that should lead, really, uh, in, in dialogue. We are the people who should lead in openness. We are the people who should lead in, in, uh, in dialogue with the religions. Because we come from these multitudes of cultures and civilizations. When Islam came, it claimed in Mecca, the host of the Kaaba, the Holy Kaaba, as you know, for Muslims, which was built maybe millions of years ago, we believe. But we believe that Abraham, the father of all religions, we pay great respect to, the, to Abraham as the father of all religions, Islam took 2,400 years, more or less, to emanate from Arabia, from Mecca. And there is a question, why would that happen? We believe there is a preparation period for Islam to come out from Arabia, where most of, all of the kingdoms you saw today, all these cultures have actually collapsed or disappeared. The Romans came through Arabia, a lot of cultures, wars, trade. Part of Arabia in the north was likened by one of the German team members who work in Saudi Arabia, Taima, as being the New York of the ancient world. Trade and, and economy was being managed and being used for politics, of course. When Islam came, 
There's only really one superpower, if you like, in Mecca, a city-state that has controlled the economy of Arabia, that has really can call, that can call itself a power. So it can, Islam came to a powerful place, came to Mecca, where the tribes of Quraysh and the travelers came with culture, came with poetry, came with uh, trade. It was a very powerful economic and political center in Arabia. And Islam came to challenge the prevalent uh, religious practices, even the pilgrimage and the paganism of the area to challenge that in its most powerful place. And Islam came and was revealed to a man that was known to be pious and to be honest, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but who did not read or write. And this great Prophet started reciting the verses of the Quran that were that came to him from Allah, from God as we know, uh, to a people that thought of language as their specialty. The tribes of Quraysh and the travelers came and hung these beautiful poems every year on the Kaaba, the winners of the prizes of the big market that happens and still happens in Saudi Arabia today in the mountains of Saudi Arabia where all the ten caravans came and traded and exchanged culture, poetry, stories and so on. So can we do that? It's almost like somebody like me comes to the other stars of this situation and tells them, I'm going to show you how to do this living person. And we need a complete ignorant person when it comes to uh, doing research and research or coming to Western House and telling them, I'm not sure how to do it, we design a new kind of This is exactly what happened. This exhibition is really focused on that to show that this is a land of great history, a land that stands on the shoulders of great cultures that we respect and we pay homage to. And uh, coming to Pittsburgh was not a coincidence. I heard from you today, you actually corrected even my numbers, my, my expectations. I know that Pittsburgh today is only a, way, a, a, day, a day away, driving, I imagine, from 60% of the population of North America. I'm going to tell my people and the, the museum's people to really get on with the public relations program and reach out to 60% of the people in North America. The Pittsburgh hosts a great number of institutions, educational, medical, scientific, great corporations, and an education, educated population, schools, and it also is in the center of a pool of great institutions and universities within less than a day drive. So our audience today is these people, the more educated people, the cultured people, the people that want to understand without maybe preconceptions. We, like you, like the United States, in our part of the world, we, Saudi Arabia, have gotten a bad rap in terms of the media. I've always believed, and I think we all believe, that to clarify what Saudi Arabia is about is not to go on the defensive. It's to showcase what exactly is happening in Saudi Arabia. It is a country that can proudly say, telling the truth will be almost unbelievable to a lot of people. It would sound like public relation, media campaign. But really what's happening in Saudi Arabia today is absolutely beyond belief. This is owed to great leadership since the inception of Saudi Arabia. This is owed of a collection or a collective effort by everyone in Saudi Arabia, young men, older men, the values of the people of the, the people of the country, and to a great leadership that keeps reinventing the place of Saudi Arabia in the world. This is a country that is in partnership in the G20, in partnership with great countries like the United States, to look at the future and to see how we can be a part of the new world coming forward. You mentioned, you gave me the chance, you opened the small window by mentioning I've been to space, which I have, and I'm very grateful for this country, giving me this great opportunity with my colleagues and the science team to do this. But seeing Earth from space is a question that kept coming back, back to me. Everyone that I meet wants to see, how did I see Earth from space? And it's very hard to explain. And in fact, while the space mission I in fact mentioned, when somebody asked me about terrorism in the world and so on, and politicians, no offense intended, <laughs> I, said, I said, I wish every politician becomes a prerequisite, would go to space, and maybe this will happen with my friend. At the, at the Space Galactic people, uh, Mr. Branson is a good friend and 
he tried to get me to go on his machine. I said, I've done this before. <laughs> but I said, I wish every politician will have a chance, would be required to go to space and see the earth from a distance. See how small it is, how fragile it is, how far it is in the middle of nowhere. And they were all sitting and really in a very small planet. Of course, I almost finished the sentence by saying, and keep them there. <laughs> but, but didn't. But to answer the question you asked me before, uh, is that I did, I was asked that question. And on the fifth day of the mission, on a press conference, and I really reflected very quickly on the last five days in the mission, very busy, it was a seven day mission. And I said, well, you know, at the first day or so, we all pointed to our countries. And the second day, third or fourth day, we started pointing to our continents, just without even feeling. By the fifth day, we were really aware of one Earth. And it was an amazing feeling that still lasts until today with me. So my colleagues who travel with me keep asking me, are we really going to do these 15 cities in 10 days or something like that? It's like a campaign. And I tell them, oh, I just don't feel like there is borders and destinations. Of course, by the end of the trip, they're all dragging their feet to go home. I really want to thank you, Excellency, and the, our guests and colleagues. I want to thank the people of Pittsburgh for opening their hearts before their museum. And I have to say today, this is a first class event. This is an event of a lifetime, and Pittsburgh has really delivered. So thank you very much for all.